Thank you for joining us today. My name is Dan Hartledge and I serve as president of the Louisville Forum. We typically meet on the second Wednesday of every month at Vincenzo's restaurant in downtown Louisville. But for now, with the pandemic, we are meeting virtually. And this month, to accommodate the schedule of the state legislature, we are meeting on a Tuesday rather than the second Wednesday. The meeting is occurring by way of Zoom and is also being live streamed on the Louisville Forum Facebook page. The Louisville Forum is a nonpartisan public issues group founded in 1984. The forum hosts debates and discussions of contemporary and sometimes controversial public policy issues that affect the greater Louisville community. Although we may take up issues that have a national interest, we try to highlight them from a local perspective. And the Louisville Forum never takes a position on an issue. For more information on the Louisville Forum, our programs, or to make a reservation in the future, please visit our website at louisvilleforum.org. Our topic today is the 2020 Kentucky General Assembly, priorities, challenges, and possibilities. Last year's legislative session ended early because of the arrival of COVID-19 and Kentucky lawmakers returned to Frankfurt about two weeks ago for this session, and no doubt this will be a busy and some say contentious session. In addition to passing a budget, there is intense debate on such issues as Governor, Bash Governor Bashir's authority to exercise emergency powers during the pandemic, pension benefits for teachers, criminal justice, and police reform. And there is even a petition calling for the impeachment of the governor. We are very fortunate to have four leaders from the state legislature join us today as our panel to talk about all of these issues and a whole lot more. They are Senator Julie Rocky Adams, Majority Caucus Chair, Senator Morgan McCarvey, Minority Floor Leader, Representative Chad McCoy, House Majority Whip, and Re Representative Joni Jenkins, House Minority Floor Leader. And to all four of you panelists, we greatly appreciate you taking the time out of a busy schedule to do this. And with that, I would like to start with each of you giving us an overview of say two or three minutes of the priorities and challenges of this session. And then we'll take questions from the audience. And Senator Rocky Adams, we'll start with you. Sure, thank you. I'm uh, really happy to be here with everyone today. Um, you know, the um, Kentucky State Senate, the Republican caucus had their um, retreat in, um, in kind of early December. And one of the things that we talked about um, as far as prioritizing our agenda for the session is, you know, what, is, what do we think it's gonna look like? And the truth is that in a short session, you really only kind of do cleanup. You don't have these real extraordinary kind of um, uh, legislative initiatives that you that you tackle. You and so in keeping with that spirit of what a short session was designed to be, um, the Senate has been trying to narrow its focus into some really strong, just simple priorities. One of which um, you mentioned is dealing with the executive orders from the governor's office. There isn't one executive order that he has executed that hasn't touched someone, some family, some business um, across this Commonwealth. So we felt it important to take that up as an initiative. The second thing is, is that we have to pass a budget. Um, our, um, our budget last time was just, it was a one-year budget. It was just pulled together because we did not know what the future looked like with regard to the pandemic and all of the um, health and economic concerns that were um, unfolding as a result of that pandemic. And so then lastly, we encouraged our members to introduce bills that they felt were um, really important to them and part of the reason why they ran. And each of us has our own set of priorities that we bring to Frankfurt. Um, we didn't promise anything as far as bandwidth because we are gonna have some concerns with bandwidth, but each member you know, has been taking the time and working on the initiatives that are important to them. And some of the things that I have filed this session are um, 
and I've been working on with um, Senator Gerald Neal. This is kind of um, his initiative, but I've been um, working with him is superintendent screening committees so that those um, districts that have um, a certain percentage of black and minority populations um, have to consider that when they, um, when they participate in the superintendent screening. Um, one of the things that I've also sponsored is the repeal of the collaborative agreement for the advanced practice registered nurses. I think one of the things that this pandemic has shown us is that we need access, more access to um, medical um, care. And I think that by removing this collaborative agreement, we empower a whole segment of our nursing community to take better care um, of our citizens across this commonwealth. And then um, I'm also sponsoring a bill that will remove the state preemption so that cities like Louisville can regulate their tobacco and vaping products um, as they see fit and they don't have to wait for the state to make that move. Um, and then lastly, the other initiative that I have is the criminal justice initiative because too often we're seeing more pregnant women enter into the, um, enter into the, um, the prison system and um, a lot of times we are confining these pregnant women and what they're not getting this prenatal care that they need they are going into the voluntary confinement postpartum and that's probably the worst thing that we can do for some of these women and their mental health and so we just kind of lay out some guidelines for the corrections department to um, take up and with regard to these um, pregnant incarcerated women and so those are kind of my initiatives and um, I'm just happy to be here and happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much. And um, <laughs> Senator McGarvey, if, uh, if it works with you, you're, uh, you're up, the floor is all yours. Perfect, no, thank you guys so much for, for having me here today. Um, I can tell you how high the Louisville form rates at my house uh, that, that I actually got the permission slip to come into the office to do this panel as opposed to being from home. Uh, Julie, who, I'm sorry, Senator Adams, who was on a, a Zoom with me earlier today, understands the importance of that because on the first Zoom, my two-year-old got on and proudly announced to everyone on the panel that she used the potty this morning. Um, so that is uh, the, the big news from our house. Uh, but I'll just say, just sticking along that line, uh, Act one of the legislature is in the can. Um, and so we are finished with part one and that is where we addressed the governor's powers. Uh, I'm sure we'll have questions about this and I'm happy to talk about it at length. In my view, what happened is the part-time legislature took away powers from the full-time executive and how they can deal with a crisis. Uh, that's gonna come back to the legislature. I think the governor will veto that. And then ultimately I think that will go to the courts, which probably, is an okay thing. I mean, if we're just talking policy-wise to see what limits can the legislative branch place on the executive branch as it relates to this or any other type of emergency. And really that's gotten a lot of the headlines, but the important stuff is coming up. Uh, we did the right thing last year and uh, Representative Jenkins and Senator Adams and Representative McCoy and I were all involved in delaying the budget because you know, when the legislature meets, we had to be out by April 15th last year. And so we said, we don't have enough information to really form a budget. Uh, everybody on this call, we agree on how much money we had to spend, we, even if we disagree on how to spend it. And we didn't know how much money we were going to have. So as we go forward for the next 22 legislative days, the budget, which is Kentucky's ultimate policy document, is, is really going to be the focus. How do we help people? How do we help small businesses get the relief they need so that we can come out on the other side of this pandemic okay? In the middle of that, which will be a short and crazy session this year, we are going to have to deal um, with social justice and you know, trying to end systemic racism. In Kentucky, there's a lot of good bills that have bipartisan support to do that. There are police and criminal justice reform bills that are out there. We're going to have to look at some revenue bills, whether it's historic racing, um, uh, whether it's even full-time gaming. And of course, you know, medical marijuana is an issue that, that is out there for this session as well. So a lot of important things that are coming up, even though it's a short session, it's an important one because one thing does ring true about this election. No one is on the ballot in November. And oftentimes when you have a session when no one's on the ballot following November, you see things move a little bit uh, that, that might not move otherwise. So I'm hopeful that with the first part of the session finished, this is when we're gonna go forward and do some good things for Kentucky. 
Right. Um, and congratulations on the on the milestone there at the, <laughs> the, the potty milestone there. And thank you. <laughs> Representative McCoy, uh, if you have any such milestones to share, feel free. But uh, <laughs> and beyond yeah, that, boy. beyond that, uh, you, a, uh, you can take this wherever you would like. Yeah, all right. Thanks, Dan. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for for having me here today. Uh, my colleagues in the Senate, I think, have done a good job of kind of explaining the session. You know, from the House side, uh, there's really only one word left, and that's budget, budget, budget. You know, we we are the branch that must start it. That is our constitutional duty. You, you've seen us already get that ball rolling, trying to get to, and I'm sure you guys are, are well aware of this, kind of the sausage is made in the conference committee and the free conference committee. And, and that's where we have at this point, some few days into the session, we've gotten the budget there. And, and while that's been a rushed process, we've, we've not um, hidden the ball. We've been very transparent. We've been doing that to get to the conference committee so that the real work can begin. So you'll see uh, Senator Adams, Senator McGarvey and Representative Jenkins and myself, along with the rest of the leadership, will be meeting here very quickly to to really start putting pen to paper about the budget. As Senator McGarvey said, you know, last year it was unprecedented. We, we hope we did the right thing by just going with the one year budget. And and I, I don't feel like we're out of the woods yet. You know, um, we're, we're trying to get the vaccine rolled out. Until we do, until everything is lifted, we don't know how this economy is going to go. I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic the revenues are going to be uh, what they're predicting. But at the same time, we've got to be responsible. And I think um, with this budget process, that's going to kind of be trying to find the balance here between responsibility, doing what we need to do, um, and yet not, not spending more than we've got. So... Uh, as Senator McGarvey kind of hit on a lot of the highlights, I'm happy to answer all those questions. I'm sure you guys will have them. So that that's all I've got for an opening. Thanks. All right. Thank you. And Representative Jenkins, we saved you for last. So uh, well, take us away. Well, thank you. And thank you for the invitation to be here today. You will see my cats go in and out of because they do love the Zoom. Um, it's, it's hard being it's easy and hard being the cleanup person because so much has already been said. Uh, it is the budget. And um, we will be working on that um, uh, in the odd number session, which we usually don't. Uh, but I will have to say that in, in my experience, even though we have 22 days left, I have seen some extraordinary uh, legislation come out of a short budget. I think back to the 2015 opioid response uh, bill that was huge, that was done in, in uh, a 30 day session. So, you know, things can be done. Uh, I am hoping when we go back for our last 22 days that one of the first things that we will address is the governor's proposal to give immediate relief to those individuals who have uh, been hurt by the pandemic and have are eligible for unemployment, but for a variety of reasons have not received it, and a, a package for small business. Uh, that's one-time money that we have from the federal government that I think should be out the door as soon as possible. So I'm looking forward to that. Our caucus, um, which is um, uh, predominantly female for the first time in history and is mostly from urban suburban areas with just a few folks from the rural areas. So we are really listening to what uh, Louisville uh, is, it, what, their, what the needs of, of Metro Louisville are uh, because we have so many representatives from the Louisville area in my caucus. And so we're, we're looking at some of the things that have come out of the Metro Council. Uh, Brianna's law, which includes body cams and no knock warrants, as well as they're asked to us about a, a civilian uh, a police uh, board and the need for subpoena powers there. So we are focused on those issues, as well as some of the things that we have learned from this pandemic and certainly um, health disparities among economic and racial lines is something that we've been looking at quite a bit, as well as the reforms that we had temporarily in place for voting last session. We know that they have worked very well for our citizens and for the process. So we're looking at some of the things that we did in voting in uh, 20 that we need to make permanent and see in 22 and beyond. All right, thank you. And uh, a reminder to everybody, you can um, type in questions in the uh, in the chat um, that will be 
uh, reviewed and read aloud by Nicole. And if you're on Facebook, uh, we're monitoring those as well with Iris. Uh, we'll start with, I, I think uh, Nicole's got, a, got some questions already on cue. So um, Nicole, uh, go ahead and fire away. All right, hello everyone. Um, do the governor and legislature agree on what the revenue estimates are for FY22? Um, I.e. everyone agrees on what the total budget expenditures can be. I'll start out. Um, I think that that is in discussing the budget. That is one of the ways that we have had very meaningful and constructive conversations with the governor. And it hasn't happened on a lot of things, but when it comes to the budget, I've been very encouraged. Um, he has some really good, smart people over there that um, have been working very collaborative, collaboratively with the legislature. And as of right now, um, it seems as if we agree kind of, you know, generally on the baseline of what he was working off of and what I think we need to work off of. Anybody else want to expound on that? Any other thoughts? Yeah, let, let me just chime in, though. I mean, I think the numbers, though, everyone would acknowledge it's an estimate. You know, the consensus forecast group um, is a nonpartisan, bipartisan, however you want to look at it. And, and they're giving us their best guess. And I'm sure we've got hundreds of economists on this call with us that would also offer equally valid opinions um, we, we just don't know. And that's why I again want to kind of come back to let's be responsible. Let's use a little caution. All of the forecasting in the world has never been through a pandemic. And we've got to remember that. Go ahead, Nicole. Another question? I do have another question. First of all, someone um, said that they think all four of you are good uh, examples of legislative leaders. So I wanted to say that. Um, and the question is, what state are you modeling your legislation on regarding restricting executive emergency powers with hundreds of thousands of lives at stake? We know you choose to follow a successful template. What state should we aspire to follow? Let me jump in on that, guys, if you don't mind. The um... This December, I, I got to attend um, a bipartisan nationwide conference. It's the National Conference of State Legislators. And there was a meeting of all the leadership of all the states around. And, and interesting, um, regardless of whether you were a Republican or a Democrat, and regardless of whether your governor was a Republican or Democrat, there was a, a, a nationwide push, if you will, that the, that the legislative branch needs to step up. We, we were seeing across the country what we would call an infringement on the separation of powers. And, and we may all agree, look, I, I think Governor Bashir's done a great job. Um, at the end of the day, I, I don't know that any of his decisions have been wrong, but I would also say, I don't like the process. And you know, one thing we learned from the prior governor was that process matters and voices matter. And what we're seeing around the country is a, a clear overstep by executive branch into that legislative branch purview. And so it's not really a desire to curtail anybody's powers or change what's been done as much as it is to make sure that we have a better process. And again, that's bipartisan across the country. And, and I'll, I'll jump in here too uh, and start off by agreeing with Representative McCoy. I mean, I think when you look at people who are in the legislature, we've run and, and we're serving because we want to help people. And this pandemic hit right at the time when we lost all of our ability as legislators to do something, but we're still on the front lines. And I think probably everybody on this call has been helping with constituents from everything from unemployment to school to business to mental health issues. Uh, that, that were coming up and, and we weren't able, we weren't in session able to do anything. You know, what worries me, and, and you asked about what are best practices, we brought someone in from the National Conference of State Legislators to talk to our caucus about this. Um, and while there are best practices across different states, you've got to remember that all of the state legislators operate slightly differently as well. 
Um, so one of the problems we have in Kentucky is that we are a part-time legislature. And when you have a full-time executive who's making these decisions, yes, the pandemic is what we're all focused on right now. But like, if you look back and what are our states of emergency that have been before this, one frequent state of emergency we have in Kentucky that lasts for a fairly long time is drought. Uh, and so, you know, do we need the legislature coming in every 30 days to confirm it's not raining? Uh, and, I, and I don't know that, that that's what we need. Um, and so, you know, I think that we needed some input. I'm a legislator, right? So I look at this as, as really, as Representative McCoy said, a process issue. This is an institutional issue. How do we want the legislative branch to interact with the executive branch on a state of emergency? Because the one thing I know is that the current makeup of the legislature and the current makeup of the executive branch is going to change. Um, and so how do we write that policy? And at the end of the day, I think it's a good to have this conversation. The legislation that was proposed, I thought was ultimately too short and cut into the, the governor's power with a part-time legislature, especially we didn't change our power. Um, and so, you know, we'll see what the courts say and then maybe we'll get another crack at it. Okay, I, I would like to, oh, yeah, go ahead. Well, I would like to add to that be, uh, as I when people have asked me about the executive orders and I support the governor and I think he's done the right thing, but I think it's always healthy to have discussions about how you want government going forward. And our system of a citizen legislature was established a long, long time ago and things have changed a lot. And I think it's uh, perhaps time as we've learned from this pandemic to discuss what does Kentucky want their system to look like going forward. It's a long-term, very, very deep conversation, but I think it's one that perhaps we should have. And it, we will not make those decisions, I think wisely in one 30-day session. All right. Um, Iris, uh, what are you finding on Facebook Live? Great, thank you, Dan. And, and thanks to many of you for sending your questions, um, even through text those of you that found me, so thank you. Um, we received a couple of questions regarding education and I would be remiss if I did not sort of highlight, particularly within the Louisville Forum, you know, education, specifically public education, education choices um, continues to be a hot button issue amongst the membership. And so in that context, when we talk about education and choices, um, meanwhile, recognizing this year, you know, there is going to be a renewed focus on equity access, impacts due to COVID and so forth, uh, would love to welcome your all's feedback around proposals on full education choice, um, particularly you know, opportunities to, uh, for families to explore um, education op options beyond uh, public education and what that means for Kentucky families. So I'd like to start off with uh, Representative McCoy uh, to get your thoughts and feedback on uh, possible uh, proposals that'll be explored this year. Sure, and and uh, you know, I, I last year with uh, Leader Carney being out sick, um, took up one of his bills, the the scholarship tax credit bill. Uh, that's been changed quite a bit this year, and quite frankly, through input with a lot of folks that are probably against that as a concept. Uh, but but this uh, kind of highlights something. Senator McGarvey and I are both touching on that process matters and process works. I think we've got a much better proposal this year, something called an uh, uh, education opportunity grants. And the whole concept really is doing what's best for students, um, not anything that's against public education. I'm a, I'm a product of Eastern Kentucky public education, love, love the public schools and want to make them as good as we can. But at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm somebody because of my job and my wife's job, we have options that maybe other people don't have. And the education opportunity grants would apply to anybody, any, any child, doesn't matter if you're in a public school or a private school. And they would allow a family who applies, who doesn't have the means, and it is all means based, don't believe all the, oh, this is a way for rich people to get scholarships, that's not true. But it, it would allow kids who need counseling, who need tutoring, who need a MacBook, who need something else, whatever it is, including maybe their parents want to send them to a private school or even a different public school. It would allow money to be used in, in any educational choice or opportunity they've got. So, you know, it's, it's not designed in any, in any way to be um, against the public schools. 
it's instead really trying to be pro kid. I guess I'll, I'll jump in here for, for just a second. And um, although in this short session, I haven't reviewed Representative McCoy's revamped proposal. Um, you, you just wanna say, I understand why people are talking about this. Two of my three are old enough to be in school uh, and have not been in a school since March 13th. And I know how hard this is on families and I know how hard this is on kids. Uh, and so I understand why we're having this conversation. But I also wanna say when, when people say we want to have kids to have choice, the hallmark of Jefferson County Public Schools is choice. If you are in a Jefferson County Public School, you have a cluster of six schools plus access to the magnets. Plus really, you can, you can go to just about any school you want to if you really put your mind to it in Jefferson County. Um, I know that I went to Manual High School um, and graduated from Manual, which was definitely a choice and an option for me to go to school. And so we have choice built in. And the reality is we need to be looking in our budget to help the kids who are in our public schools. And we are gonna have to do things like Representative McCoy said, we need to be building budget with some of this one-time money we have from the federal government for intervention, for mental health services, for catching kids up, for really going after our most vulnerable populations. But at a base level, I think there are two types of parents and thus two types of kids in Jefferson County. And that's choosers and non-choosers. And to me, this bill doesn't help get to the kids who don't have someone in their life who already doesn't care enough about their education to help them get where they need to be. And I think in state government this year in this budget, that's where we need to be focused, obviously on all our kids. But if we're gonna take that special focus, it needs to be on truly our, our most vulnerable kids and the help they need. Now also, I'll jump in here and you know, maybe not on the choice issue, but um, you know, we've had kids who have not been in school since March. So we're also gonna have real educational um, decisions to make relative to how do we test these kids who are you know, losing skills because they haven't been in the classroom? How are we going to capture those kids that whose parents have never checked them in on NTI since the beginning of school? How are we going to work on you know, some of these issues that are a result of the pandemic? And so there is an enormous amount of conversation and discussion that needs to go into a holistic educational response because it, it's hit us in every way, shape, and form. Um, and so it, it, is, it is my hope that we don't have people dig into what their kind of default positions are. We need to have everybody kind of come with open minds and open hearts as to how we solve these real problems because it's, um, I'm worried that it's going to take us years to come back from some of these um, decisions that have resulted from a pandemic, not from any other reason, but it's this pandemic that has done our children an injustice more than anyone else. I would like to echo what Senator Rocky Adams said. I've been talking about this a lot about how we uh, innovatively look at what happens when kids do come back into the building and how we evaluate them. Uh, I think Jefferson County Public Schools have done an excellent job in pivoting since March and trying to find those kids and, and looking at innovative ways to reach them and to teach them. And I am fully uh, confident that under the great leadership of our superintendent and the great teachers that we have, that once they come back in the building, that we are going to be able to provide interventions to them. But that does take money. And I think we have to be very thoughtful in crafting the budget around education about where those dollars go. And I'm always very leery of, of programs that sound very great, but would take money out of the public school budget. So I think we have to be very careful about that. And thank you to our four leaders here, um, all commenting on this issue. It continues to be a hot one for our membership. So thank you for your feedback on, on education. Switching gears a bit here, going back to the budget, for those that may choose not to follow it play by play, like some of us, you know, I, I, we're getting a couple of questions about the process and maybe even a bit of a philosophical attitude towards the budgeting process. Um, in particular, we would like to get your all's uh, thoughts and feedback about priorities. 
Um, there were some comments made a couple days ago regarding maybe one-time funding opportunities and maybe some legislative leaders, you know, having specific attitudes about uh, budgeting dollars that may be given out sort of as a one-time opportunity. Uh, and then also uh, some expenditures that may be unique to COVID and addressing COVID impacts. And so, uh, Representative Jenkins, I'd like to start with you. You know, what are you looking for in this budget process uh, to prioritize to support Kentuckians? Well, I've, I've always said our budget is our moral document because that's really where we walk our talk. And, uh, you know, there, there are some philosophical differences, I think, maybe among even the leaders on here. Um, there is uh, the, the budget that left, and let's be honest, the budget that left the House and Senate and went into conference committee is not going to be the budget that we will ultimately see. It was a means to get a means to get it into conference committee during the interim so work could start on it. Uh, but I, I do believe that there is a difference in how much money we're going to put in the rainy day fund. And my philosophy is that when your kids are hungry, you don't go put all your money into a savings account. I think we need to have a, uh, a good amount, a, a stable amount in the rainy day fund. But I think it's raining in Kentucky right now. And there are a lot of people that have been hurt by this pandemic. So I am very much in favor of taking some of the one-time money from the federal government and giving immediate relief to families and to small businesses. At the same time, there are certain things that we have to fund. We have to fund education. We have to fund corrections. We have to fund Medicaid. And we have historically high numbers of folks that are being uh, benefited by our Medicaid program. And certainly we want to provide that help to them at this time, but we also want to start working them on their way to self-sufficiency. And we do that through education and through economic spending. Um, I'll, I'll jump in. I've always um, had a huge kind of bee in my bonnet about how human services always get the short end of the stick when it comes to budgeting. And I think that, and it's because the constituencies are such that they, they aren't the squeaky wheel. They're the, they're the silent sufferers. And so, and Joni and Representative Jenkins and I have always fought this same fight every uh, budget cycle. And so I think that if we have one-time monies, and if we look at the human services aspects of our budgets and we take care of those needs now, then we see a return on the back end of those dollars being spent in the right places at the right time for the right populations. So we don't have to spend them later on um, fourfold or tenfold. And so I'm going to take a really hard nosed look at how we're spending those human services dollars because they are critical at this particular juncture in our budgeting process. Yeah, I'll take just a quick um, second here, echo the comments of Representative Jenkins and Senator Adams. I think you're going to see a lot of agreement. Explain to people, too, that we do have obligations in the budget, and, and it really, we rely on the governor's cabinet for estimates on numbers. We rely on the consensus forecasting group to tell us how much money we're going to have, and then just there is a certain percentage earmarked. We have a constitutional right to a public education in Kentucky. In Kentucky's constitution, it has to go to public education. There's an earmarked amount that goes to Medicaid. There's an earmarked amount from gas tax and automobile use tax, for example, that goes just to infrastructure um, and, and road funding and, and whether we need more money in that particular uh, instance. So, you know, by the time we get the budget, yes, we get a little bit of, of wiggle room, but a lot of it, we kind of try to get together and, and say, how are we going to use this money responsibly? Um, I do think we have some one-time federal funds and, and when we left last April, we were all expecting the worst. Representative McCoy is right. We still could see things take a turn because none of us have ever been in this spot before. But, but from what we know today, we've got some one-time federal stimulus money. The economy has performed better to this point than we expected. And I think we need to use some of that one-time money really wisely. Uh, as Representative Jenkins says, you know, yes, have some in the rainy day fund. We want to have some in the rainy day fund. But it's raining. Uh, in fact, Kentuckians are bailing out their basements and the sump pump's broken, and we need to help them. Uh, and you know this for people, if you have a small business, if you've dealt with unemployment, if you've seen your business decrease, we have a lot of people who are really hurting uh, and, and something I've become fond of saying, that pain is not partisan. And if we're really gonna come out on the other side of this pandemic 
uh, well, then we have to use some of that money we, we have right now on those one-time expenditures to get people where they need to be. And, and I just want to caution though, I don't want to see us use one-time money in a recurring situation because then all we've done is create some unfunded liabilities for the future. And that's, you know, that's, that's going to be the rub I think here. Okay. Uh, uh, Nicole, what's, uh, what do you have on your end? I do. I have a couple that I'm going to try to combine here. What is the status and timeline of redistricting based on the census results? And then uh, several of you have mentioned that you have limitation. It's a short session. Do we need to re-examine the length of the off-year sessions in order to accomplish more? And if not, why not? Morgan, you want to start? It, it, it's bad to ask a member of the minority about where redistricting stands. Um, I, believe me, if, if, if I had the answer or the influence, I would give it to you and I would use it. Um, we, are gonna, we do try to redistrict and the idea of redistricting itself is not partisan. Once we get into the process, it becomes mostly partisan here in Kentucky. And that's a, that's a historic thing on both sides. Um, we usually redistrict in years, years that end with two. Uh, we don't have the census results right now. And as it stands, uh, we might not have those census results in time to draw districts before the filing deadline of the 2022 session. So where it stands, the short answer, I don't know. Um, and what was the second part of the question, Nicole? Um, with it being a short session, um, do you think that um, you guys need to reconsider your session so that you can get more work done? Yeah, no, I, I, this is a big question right now. And uh, Speaker Osborne has put a bill forward that I think he has really wisely, and in my opinion, held back to this point to try and get input because this is an institutional question. How do we want the legislature in Kentucky to function going forward? Um, I think that it makes sense to change that a little bit. That's gonna have to be done constitutionally. Right now, the Kentucky constitution says, no matter what, we're out on, on midnight at March 30th. And next year, no matter what, we're out after 60 legislative days on April 15th. So we can't change that until we change the constitution. But I think it really is a conversation that's it's time to be had. We need deadlines for things like the budget. I mean, look, my mom always had a sign on the refrigerator that said, if it weren't for the last minute, nothing would ever get done. Um, you got to remember that, that legislators are people too. And we operate on deadlines. So I think it's good to have some deadlines. But as we've seen, whether it's it's the pandemic, whether it's been the opioid crisis, whether it's been any number of things that have happened in Kentucky, the idea of, of even tax reform, which has never really happened in a meaningful way, using the ability, the legislature having the ability to come back in a, a limited period of time, other than we're just in our regular session. I think we need to have that conversation. And I think we need to, to put something forward that ideally has bipartisan, not just bipartisan, Democrat, Republican, Earl, oh, I said Earl, urban and rural uh, support. I mean, really the support of the legislature to put before the people of Kentucky and, and see how we want the legislature to function going forward. Now I'll, I'll pipe in on the redistricting front because, um, you know, I, I, I have a, you know, the constitution says that you have to redistrict every 10 years. The constitution doesn't say you have to redistrict every 10 years based on census numbers. Um, and so if you look at how um, the demographics have shifted in this state over the last 10 years, you know, you'll see a district like mine that's extremely overpopulated, like it compared to, you know, some of the Senate districts out in Western Kentucky that are severely underpopulated. So what that means is that my constituents in Jefferson County, because I'm overpopulated, have less of a voice in Frankfurt than somebody in Western Kentucky who's underpopulated. And so because we're so out of conformity, it's not fair for my constituents to have less of a voice than somebody else who's representing a smaller group of people. So we have to make a decision to redistrict. And you know, one of the things that I, I thought might be constructive is this session to go ahead and pass a, um, a bill so that everyone knows what's gonna happen in 22, unless the governor calls us back into a se special session when we get the um, 
census numbers later this year. I mean, I hope he will, but um, if he doesn't, I think um, it would be important to go ahead and maybe make the statement um, that in 22, we push the filing deadline back because we'll have to redistrict at the beginning of 22. Um, so I don't know, there, there is, but those conversations are happening and they're, they're very real because um, like I said, we have a real conformity issue in this state and it's a constitutional question. Okay. I jump in here on the, oh, go ahead. oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Well, I just wanted to throw in one more thing. You know, uh, Senator McGarvey started talking about it. Uh, Rep. Speaker Osborne's bill, uh, the last half of that question, do we need to be rethinking our sessions? You know, the, that bill just does, uh, it takes away the, the ending date. And so what it would do is not necessarily cost us any more money and would not necessarily create any more legislative days but would give us the ability to maybe right now we've adjourned, right? So we could adjourn until June, come back for five days in June, adjourn again until September. Um, it, it, it gives us some flexibility. And for a lot of people go back to that separation of powers discussion earlier, this would be a really nice inherent check. And then maybe wouldn't require any limiting of anybody's powers because in the states where we, we see it done differently, those states have the ability for the legislature to be there more frequently than we are. So uh, just, just something for everybody to think about as we're, as we're looking at, at that change, because as, as everyone has said, it would require a constitutional amendment. Okay, great. I'm gonna move on to one more question so we can get as many in as possible. Do you favor granting subpoena powers to Louisville's newly formed Civilian Re Review Board and or Office of Inspector General? Why or why not? Senator McGarvey, you want to chime in there? Sorry. Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, I can answer this one shortly. Yes, um, I, I think it's, it's very necessary uh, because if you want real civilian oversight in a meaningful way, then they're going to have to be able to get the information to do their job. Uh, you, want, you want there to be some teeth, some power there. And remember what the Civilian Review Board and the Inspector General are doing. They are gathering information and then they are simply submitting a recommendation of what they believe should happen. So they need the information available to them, um, whether it's even something as simple as, as cell phone or medical records that you can't get without a subpoena, uh, then you need to have that, that power there. I really think that is one of the more meaningful things the legislature can do this session in terms of uh, reform here in Louisville, uh, whether uh, police reform and, and the, what we've seen happen um, after the death of Breonna Taylor. I think that that really, the Civilian Review Board piece is one of the most meaningful things we can do. Okay, do others wanna chime in on this one as well? I, I agree with Senator McGarvey. And I do think that when this gets up and running, we will get so much good information that will lead us down in the future on good police reform as well. Yeah, I, um, I had a lot of conversations with um, Councilwoman McCraney about this. And um, I'm sorry, my cat's in the way now too. Joni's is taking <laughs> a bath and mine's quite right face. <laughs> The, uh, and, and I support um, Councilwoman McCraney's bill, you know, passing something in the Metro Council is a little bit different than trying to get something passed in Frankfurt. But I think that um, I agree, we need subpoena power. Um, there's been too much that um, has gone undiscoverable because we haven't had that ability or the, the city has not had that ability. So whatever form that takes, I just, I wanna, participate in it. I think it's important that we, we figure out a mechanism in which to do that because it's, it's just very important. So, so I'll, I'll throw in the one uh, disagreement here then. And, and I don't live in Louisville, so I, I'm not trying to get into Louisville's business, but uh, I worry when we, when we give Everyone subpoena else. power. Um, you know, as an officer of the court, we, subpoenas are a, a huge invasion into someone's private rights. And if there's not a neutral and detached magistrate that is looking over that and issuing the subpoena, then I would not be in favor of that. We've got to make sure due process is being followed. 
One question I've received by way of text, uh, and by the way, if you want to text, feel free at, at uh, 502-741-0969. Question for each of you is, uh, to what extent are you concerned about uh, safety at the Capitol in light of the uh, riots in Washington, D.C.? Anybody want to take that one first? I'm very concerned and in fact have had several meetings with the head of security for uh, the General Assembly and very shortly my caucus is getting training on what to do should something happen in the annex, what to do if some, something should happen in the chamber. Um, I hope that we will revisit the ability for folks to carry automatic weapons into the Capitol. I'm completely in favor of law-abiding citizens being able to carry, but why anyone would need to carry into our state Capitol, I think is a question that we should revisit. Um, no, I was shocked on January 6th to see what happened at the US Capitol and um, would hate to think that that could happen in Kentucky, but it can. And uh, we are uh, being very, very careful this week in and around the Kentucky uh, Capitol. Uh, so I think it's something we should be considering. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just speak up, you know, just based on emails and, um, you know, messages that I get on social media, there are people who are very angry. It's not that they're angry at Republicans or Democrats, they're angry at government. And they look at government um, in a very different way. And so I see firsthand that there are, um, that there are real threats, both individually and collectively as government. Um, and so we have to do something. I mean, you know, it, it's beyond time. And I know I have the same conversation with my colleagues that you should never have a gun involved when you're discussing public policy. It's just, it's a bad move. We use words, we don't use violence. And so um, God, if there's anything that we can take care of, it's, it's making some adjustments to how we communicate and how we interact and, and, and how we arrive at decisions. It's just really important. I, I couldn't agree more with my two colleagues and their remarks. Um, you can't bring signs on sticks into the Capitol, but you can bring an automatic weapon. Uh, and, and somehow we need to be having these conversations. Uh, and look, you're going to have big disagreements in Frankfurt, and you're going to have big disagreements even with some of the people on this call. Although I will say, not to rat anybody out, we all, all four of us are, are all friends, um, you know, but we are going to disagree on, on public policy. And so you know, I think last Wednesday should have been a real wake up call to everyone and how we need to do things differently and, and how we can make some of those um, actual physical changes going forward too. Uh, and I'll, I'll just add though, I don't think it's our decision. Um, my understanding is the Capitol is under the control of the executive branch and any of the rules and regulations around that are, are sort of out of our control other than our own individual floors um, so for what that's worth, I don't know that we have a lot of input into it. Okay, Iris, what's on your end? Sure, and my uh, topic is very broad and I'm going to frame it as such and empower our legislators to, to comment on which issue um, they feel that they could speak to the most. So the broad topic is vaccines. Uh, we received many questions about distribution, some expressing opinions about how successful or maybe unsuccessful the distribution and its communications has been throughout the Commonwealth. And so would welcome your all thoughts, feedback, potentially even uh, describe the role of the legislature in vaccine distribution and how it's going. And then also another related note about vaccine mandates. Um, there's a couple of legislative proposals that restrict uh, vaccine mandates, recognizing we all want to prioritize public health, keeping our economy open, uh, while balancing uh, individual rights, you know, what is the role of the legislature to um, explore options that may impact vaccines um, and how they function in our communities and uh, the economy? So I'd like to start with uh, Senator Adams and then we'll just open it up. Well, um, I mean, as far as vaccine distribution goes, you know, I, um, 
and I, I was frustrated myself because you know, my parents are in their 80s and they still live at home. And you know, I tried to follow all the right steps and I called the Jefferson County Health Department and they, they didn't have a list. And then I called the state and they didn't have a list. And, and I'm thinking, well, I think we're in the 1B aspect of it right now. How come we can't do this? Um, and uh, I, I'm frustrated in, in kind of the global sense. Um, I think the Cabinet for Health and Family Services has really good people working over there. I think that they are doing the best they can. But I think that part of this is just that we just don't know how to do it. Um, I think that the, um, the allotments that we're getting are based upon, um, you know, different variables. And, uh, you know, part of me wishes that we could rely more kind of on the private sector to help with this. Um, I think that that's a great avenue for us to go down. Um, but it's it's been frustrating. And I take calls and emails all day long about how can I get how can I get my parents on a list? How can I, you know, my parents are in Barron County and I and they don't have any access to it. Can we bring them up to Jefferson County? Um, so it's um, we have to get a clear set of guidelines going forward so that we can be as efficient as possible with this vaccination plan. I was just on a call with the secretary of the cabinet today talking a little bit about this and, you know, the, the process for giving the, vac the vaccines is very complex. They have to be followed. They can only, you know, you have a certain amount and um, you don't want any of that to go to waste. So, you know, when I have constituents call and say, why can't my doctor give me the vaccine? It's, it's a lot of those things complicate things, but it is according to uh, Secretary Freelander, it is a question of the amount that we are getting and the ability to make sure that we have enough to give the folks that second vaccine that they'll need. So it's, it's very complex. Um, I think Kentucky is doing a good job where we seem to be doing better than a lot of the other states, but certainly um, there is room for improvement. And I'm hoping with a new federal administration, we might see some changes in that way. Um, I don't think the state of Kentucky has ever mandated vaccines of any kind. Um, and I would probably defer to the two attorneys on here about the ability for businesses uh, to uh, mandate uh, a vaccine for, for their employees, but I don't see um, the General Assembly mandating vaccines of any kind, including this one. And, and I'll just jump in here too, and again, see some agreement on this. I'll also say that we're legislators. And so a lot of times you ask us questions like this, the calls we get are either everything's going great for someone or everything is as bad as it could possibly be. We don't get a lot of in the middle calls of, you know, yeah, things are okay. Um, and so, you know, uh, I've heard this week some really good um, and encouraging news about the vaccination plan rolling out for, for both our seniors and for our teachers here in Jefferson County. Um, I think there's a really good plan to get every teacher vaccinated within the coming week or two. Um, I know my sister, who's a teacher, was in line already yesterday at Broadbent Arena. So, you know, there's some good news there, but also, you know, some people who are really frustrated as we're trying to go through this and, and get the plan out. Um, the legislature doesn't have as active a role in actually pushing the vaccine out. Again, that, that's probably not something you want. 138 people trying to vote on every step of how to distribute a vaccine, but, but we are certainly asking those questions and, and talking with the governor's office and talking with the cabinet and giving them the feedback we receive. So always let us know what you're hearing, even if it's just okay news. Um, right now, we don't mandate vaccines in Kentucky. Um, there are obviously certain times you can never mandate a vaccine. I think the sincerely held religious belief what will always trump uh, that, that vaccine, right? But um, schools and businesses can require uh, vaccinations at this point in Kentucky. Yeah, I think, I think everybody's hit on it. You know, there, there's certainly no push, uh, contrary to what I read on the internet all the time, for us to make vaccines mandatory. I'm not seeing anything about that. In fact, we're going the other direction. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I do hope, um, you know, I'm getting the same calls like everybody is. Hey, my parents are in their 70s, 80s, 90s. They don't have internet. How can they get a vaccine? Um, I hope if we're going to get the teachers in front of those folks that we're going to get our schools open. 
because there's a whole lot of reasons that we need kids back in school. And so if, if, if as a society, we've made that decision that, that our teachers are going to get it in front of our elderly, then we all need to get back to work. And I just think that's critical on so many levels. So hopefully that's what we're going to see happen. Okay, we have time for one more quick question and answer, I believe, and Nicole is going to um, do that. I am, and I want to personally thank each of you for agreeing to take time out of your schedule today uh, to be a part of the panel. The question is, um, is there any hope, and I, I think all four of you um, are good examples of this, is there any hope for Kentucky legislators to work together in a bipartisan manner, what, what will it take to do that? And are you willing to commit to bipartisanship for the good of the Commonwealth? Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, go ahead, Julie. You don't need to. <laughs> the, um, you know, just from a practical standpoint, you know, I'm, gosh, this cat is killing me. Um, from a practical standpoint, I always say I can't get anything done in the city of Louisville if I don't have Democrat partners. And I look at my Democrat partners um, to work with me to get things done in Frankfurt. So it's a, it's a pure give and take. Um, it's in my best interest to work with people across the aisle. Now, there are some communities that don't have that give and take. Um, there are some communities that are solely one party. And, um, and I think that sometimes they come to Frankfurt and they don't quite understand that dynamic of give and take. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it's just important to set an example. And, um, and if you look at how Morgan and Joni and I interact, you know, we try to set a really positive example for that. We, we're not going to always agree. And, but we're, we're trying to move the ball down the field um, to get to the goal line because we, we both have this, we all have the same objective and that is to, you know, help Louisville, help Louisville be successful. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and, you know, we often, I think we agree oftentimes more than we disagree. Even if you just look at the vote totals of bills coming out of the Senate, far more of them have, have huge bipartisan support the note, but, but those don't make the news, right? People don't want to hear about that. Um, so I'll say that I think we do have a good working relationship. Everybody in this call has a good working relationship and, and we carry that into Frankfurt and I'll, I'll continue to do so. I, I know they will too. I'll also say this, bipartisanship doesn't mean we agree on everything, right? You can disagree in a bipartisan way. Um, and I also pledge to do that, right? To, to stick up for my constituents and my principles, but hopefully doing so in such a way that, that those concerns are heard in a real and meaningful way, not just as, as a political scoring point, because you can make legislation better with, with input from everybody in all corners of the state. You know, I, I've, I've had the luxury of, of being in Frankfurt for a long time and knowing most of the people on this call for a long time. And when you build those kinds of relationships, even though we may, disagree on policy. I love the debate and I love listening to the other points of view. And I think that really makes good policy. I do think that it's going to be a challenge going forward because of COVID. We're, we're not intermingling as much. Uh, the, uh, the House Republicans, have, I believe, have 21 new people. I've gotten to know very few of those in, right. in the days I've been there, just, just because of social distancing and that type of thing. So that's um, and that's a challenge that we need to um, uh, overcome, as well as the challenge of debate on the floor. I have many members of my caucus, and I'm sure Representative McCoy has some on his that just don't feel safe to be on the floor. And that, that's going to um, uh, be a challenge to, to thoroughly debate and vet some of these policies. So we're looking at innovative ways to allow that to happen. I, I, I couldn't agree more, and I'll, I'll just tell you guys, you, you, you're lucky. The, guy, the guys and gals representing you in Louisville are, are always working together. Um, the media doesn't, doesn't show that, as Senator McGarvey said. It, it doesn't sell tickets, but the, the truth is there's a lot more bipartisan, again, doesn't mean agreement, but process. We're talking to each other. We're getting input. We're listening to those ideas, and, and what you see a lot of the times is in the House, the vote's 98 to nothing. Um, those, those bills fly right through. It's only the few that we fight about 
that that everybody seems to kind of remember and, and think about. So I appreciate the question and, and thanks again for having us here. Appreciate it. And with that, we conclude our January 2021 program and thank all of you for being here.